of Patriot patrols on the watch on all the roads. Daylight at last found them before the wall of Paris. The barrier was closed and strongly guarded when they rode up to it. Where are the papers of this prisoner? demanded a resolute looking man in authority who was summoned out by the guard. Naturally struck by the disagreeable word, Charles Darnay requested the speaker to take notice that he was a free traveller and French citizen in charge of an escort which the disturbed state of the country had imposed upon him and which he had paid for. Where, repeated the same personage, without taking any heed of him whatever, are the papers of this prisoner? The drunken patriot had them in his cap and produced them. Casting his eyes over Gabelle's letter, the same personage in authority showed some disorder and surprise, and looked at Darnay with a close attention. He left escort and escorted without saying a word, however, and went into the guard room. Meanwhile, they sat upon their horses outside the gate. Looking about him while in this state of suspense, Charles Darnay observed that the gate was held by a mixed guard of soldiers and patriots the latter far outnumbering the former, and that while ingress into the city for peasants' carts bringing in supplies and for similar traffic and traffickers was easy enough, egress, even for the homeliest people, was very difficult. A numerous medley of men and women, not to mention beasts and vehicles of various sorts, was waiting to issue forth. But the previous identification was so strict that they filtered through the barrier very slowly. Some of these people knew their turn for examination would be so far off that they lay down on the ground to sleep or smoke, while others talked together or loitered about. The red cap and tricolour cockade were universal, both among men and women. When he had sat in his saddle some half hour, taking note of these things, Dane found himself confronted by the same man in authority, who directed the guard to open the barrier. Then he delivered to the escort, drunk and sober, a receipt for the escorted, and requested him to dismount. He did so, and the two patriots, leading his tired horse, turned and rode away without entering the city. He accompanied his conductor into a guard room, smelling of common wine and tobacco, where certain soldiers and patriots, asleep and awake, drunk and sober, and in various neutral states between sleeping and waking, drunkenness and sobriety, were standing and lying about. The light in the guardhouse, half derived from the waning oil lamps of the night, and half from the overcast day, was in a correspondingly uncertain condition. Some registers were lying open on a desk, and an officer of a coarse, dark aspect presided over these. Citizen Defarge, said he to Darnay's conductor, as he took a slip of paper to write on. Is this the emigrant Evremond? This is the man. Your age, Evremond. Thirty-seven. Married, Evremond? Yes. Where married? In England. Without doubt. Where is your wife, Evremond? In England. Without doubt, you are consigned, Evremond, to the prison of La Force. Just heaven! exclaimed Darnay. Under what law and for what offence? The officer looked up from his slip of paper for a moment. We have new laws, Evremond, and new offences since you were here. He said it with a hard smile and went on writing. I entreat you to observe that I have come here voluntarily in response to that written appeal of a fellow countryman which lies before you. I demand no more than the opportunity to do so without delay. Is not that my right? Emigrants have no rights, Evremond, was the stolid reply. The officer wrote until he had finished, read over to himself what he had written, sanded it, and handed it to Defarge, with the words, In secret. Defarge motioned with the paper to the prisoner that he must accompany him. The prisoner obeyed, and a guard of two armed patriots attended them. "'Is it you?' said Defarge in a low voice, as they went down the guardhouse steps and turned into Paris. 
who married the daughter of Dr. Manette, once a prisoner in the Bastille that is no more? Yes, replied Darnay, looking at him with surprise. My name is Defarge, and I keep a wine shop in the quarter Saint Antoine. Possibly you have heard of me? My wife came to your house to reclaim her father, yes? The word wife seemed to serve as a gloomy reminder to Defarge to say with sudden impatience, In the name of that sharp female newly born and called La Guillotine, why did you come to France? You have heard me say why a minute ago. Do you not believe it is the truth? A bad truth for you, said Defarge, speaking with knitted brows and looking straight before him. Indeed, I am lost here. All here is so unprecedented, so changed, so sudden and unfair, that I am absolutely lost. Will you render me a little help? None, Defarge spoke, always looking straight before him. Will you answer me a single question? Perhaps, according to its nature, you can say what it is. In this prison that I am going to so unjustly, shall I have some free communication with the world outside? You will see. I am not to be buried there, prejudged and without any means of presenting my case. You will see. But what then? Other people have been similarly buried in worse prisons before now. But never by me, Citizen Defarge. Defarge glanced darkly at him for answer, and walked on in a steady and set silence. The deeper he sank into this silence, the fainter hope there was, or so Darnay thought, of his softening of any slight degree. He therefore made haste to say, It is of the utmost importance to me, you know, citizen, even better than I, of how much importance, that I should be able to communicate to Mr. Lorry of Telson's Bank, an English gentleman who is now in Paris, the simple fact, without comment, that I have been thrown into the prison of La Force. Will you cause that to be done for me? I will do, Defarge doggedly rejoined. Nothing for you. My duty is to my country and the people. I am the sworn servant of both against you. I will do nothing for you. Charles Darnay felt it hopeless to entreat him further, and his pride was touched besides. As they walked on in silence, he could not but see how used the people were to the spectacle of prisoners passing along the streets. The very children scarcely noticed him. A few passers turned their heads, and a few shook their fingers at him as an aristocrat. Otherwise, that a man in good clothes should be going to prison was no more remarkable than that a labourer in working clothes should be going to work. In one narrow, dark and dirty street through which they passed, an excited orator, mounted on a stool, was addressing an excited audience on the crimes against the people of the king and the royal family. The few words that he caught from this man's lips first made it known to Charles Darnay that the king was in prison, and that the foreign ambassadors had one and all left Paris. On the road, except at Beauvais, he had heard absolutely nothing. The escort and the universal watchfulness had completely isolated him. That he had fallen among far greater dangers than those which had developed themselves when he left England, he of course knew now. That perils had thickened about him fast, and might thicken faster and faster yet, he of course knew now. He could not but admit to himself that he might not have made this journey, if he could have foreseen the events of a few days. And yet his misgivings were not so dark as imagined by the light of this later time that they would appear. Troubled as the future was, it was the unknown future, and in its obscurity there was ignorant hope. The horrible massacre, days and nights long, which, within a few rounds of the clock, was to set a great mark of blood upon the blessed garnering time of harvest was as far out of his knowledge as if it had been a hundred thousand years away. The sharp female newly born called La Guillotine was hardly known to him or to the generality of people by name. The frightful deeds that were to be soon done were probably unimagined at that time in the brains of the doers. How could they have a place in the shadowy conceptions of a gentle mind? of unjust treatment in detention and hardship, and in cruel separation from his wife and child, he foreshadowed the likelihood or the certainty. But beyond this, 
he dreaded nothing distinctly. With this on his mind, which was enough to carry into a dreary prison courtyard, he arrived at the prison of La Force. A man with a bloated face opened the strong wicket, to whom Defarge presented the emigrant Evremond. "'What the devil! How many more of them?' exclaimed the man with the bloated face. Defarge took his receipt without noticing the exclamation, and withdrew with his two fellow patriots. "'What the devil, I say again!' exclaimed the jailer, left with his wife. "'How many more?' The jailer's wife, being provided with no answer to the question, merely replied, "'One must have patience, my dear.' Three turnkeys, who entered responsive to a bell she rang, echoed the sentiment, and one added, "'For the love of liberty!' which sounded in that place like an inappropriate conclusion. The prison of La Force was a gloomy prison, dark and filthy, and with a horrible smell of foul sleep in it. Extraordinary how soon the noisome flavour of imprisoned sleep becomes manifest in all such places that are ill cared for. In secret, too, grumbled the jailer, looking at the written paper, as if I was not already full to bursting. He stuck the paper on a file in an ill humour, and Charles Darnay awaited his further pleasure for half an hour, sometimes pacing to and fro in the strong arched room, sometimes resting on a stone seat, in either case detained to be imprinted on the memory of the chief and his subordinates. Come, said the chief at length, taking up his keys, come with me, emigrant. Through the dismal prison twilight, his new charge accompanied him by corridor and staircase, many doors clanging and locking behind them, until they came into a large, low, vaulted chamber crowded with prisoners of both sexes. The women were seated at a long table, reading and writing, knitting, sewing and embroidering. The men were for the most part standing behind their chairs or lingering up and down the room. In the instinctive association of prisoners with shameful crime and disgrace, the newcomer recoiled from this company. But the crowning unreality of his long unreal ride was their all at once rising to receive him, with every refinement of manner known to the time and with all the engaging graces and courtesies of life. So strangely clouded were these refinements by the prison manners and gloom so spectral did they become in the inappropriate squalor and misery through which they were seen, that Charles Darnay seemed to stand in a company of the dead. Ghosts all, the ghost of beauty, the ghost of stateliness, the ghost of elegance, the ghost of pride, the ghost of frivolity, the ghost of wit, the ghost of youth, the ghost of age, all waiting their dismissal from the desolate shore all turning on him eyes that were changed by the death they had died in coming here. It struck him motionless. The jailer standing at his side, and the other jailers moving about, who would have been well enough as to appearance in the ordinary exercise of their functions, looked so extravagantly coarse, contrasted with sorrowing mothers and blooming daughters who were there, with the apparitions of the coquette, the young beauty, and the mature woman delicately bred, that the inversion of all experience and likelihood which the scene of shadows presented was heightened to its utmost. Surely ghosts all, surely the long unreal ride, some progress of disease that had brought him to these gloomy shades. In the name of the assembled companions in misfortune, said a gentleman of courtly appearance and address, coming forward, I have the honour of giving you welcome to La Force, and of condoling with you on the calamity that has brought you among us. May it soon terminate happily. It would be an impertinence elsewhere, but it is not so here, to ask your name and condition. Charles Darnay roused himself, and gave the required information in words as suitable as he could find. But, I hope, said the gentleman, following the chief jailer with his eyes, who moved across the room, that you are not in secret? I do not understand the meaning of the term, but I have heard them say so. Ah, what a pity, we so much regret it. But take courage, several members of our society have been in secret at first, and it has lasted but a short time. 
Then he added, raising his voice, I grieve to inform the society in secret. There was a murmur of commiseration as Charles Darnay crossed the room to a grated door where the jailer awaited him, and many voices, among which the soft and compassionate voices of women, were conspicuous, gave him good wishes and encouragement. He turned at the grated door to render the thanks of his heart. It closed under the jailer's hand, and the apparitions vanished from his sight for ever. The wicket opened on a stone staircase leading upwards when they had ascended forty steps. The prisoner of half an hour already counted them. The jailer opened a low black door and they passed into a solitary cell. It struck cold and damp, but was not dark. Yours, said the jailer. Why am I confined alone? How do I know? I can buy pen, ink and paper. Such are not my orders. You will be visited and can ask then. At present you may buy your food and nothing more. There were in the cell a chair, a table and a straw mattress. As the jailer had made a general inspection of these objects and of the four walls before going out, a wandering fancy wandered through the mind of the prisoner leaning against the wall opposite to him that this jailer was so unwholesomely bloated, both in face and person, as to look like a man who had been drowned and filled with water. When the jailer was gone, he thought in the same wandering way, Now I am left, as if I were dead. Stopping then to look down at the mattress, he turned from it with a sick feeling, and thought, And here in these crawling creatures is the first condition of the body after death. Five paces by four and a half, five paces by four and a half, five paces by four and a half. The prisoner walked to and fro in his cell, counting its measurement, and the roar of the city arose like muffled drums with a wild swell of voices added to them. He made shoes, he made shoes, he made shoes! The prisoner counted the measurement again and paced faster to draw his mind with him from that latter repetition. The ghosts that vanished when the wicket closed. There was one among them, the appearance of a lady dressed in black, who was leaning in the embrasure of a window, and had a light shining upon her golden hair, and she looked like... Let us ride on again, for God's sake, to the illuminated villages, with the people all awake. He made shoes, he made shoes, he made shoes. Five paces by four and a half. With such scraps, tossing and rolling upward from the depths of his mind, the prisoner walked faster and faster, obstinately counting and counting, and the roar of the city changed to this extent, that it still rolled in like muffled drums, but with the wail of voices that he knew in the swell that rose above them. Chapter 2 the Grindstone. Established in the Saint Germain quarter of Paris, was in a wing of a large house, approached by a courtyard and shut off from the street by a high wall and a strong gate. The house belonged to a great nobleman who had lived in it until he made a flight from the troubles in his own cook's dress and got across the borders. A mere beast of the chase, flying from hunters, he was still in his metempsychosis no other than the same Monseigneur, the preparation of whose chocolate, for whose lips, had once occupied three strong men besides the cook in question. Monseigneur gone, and the three strong men absolving themselves from the sin of having drawn his high wages by being more ready and willing to cut his throat on the altar of the dawning Republic One and indivisible of liberty, equality, fraternity or death, Monseigneur's house had been first sequestrated and then confiscated. For all things moved so fast, and decree followed decree, that with fierce precipitation, that now upon the third night of the autumn month of September, patriot emissaries of the law were in possession of Monseigneur's house, and had marked it with the tricolour, and were drinking brandy in its state apartments. A place of business in London, like Telson's place of business in Paris, would soon have driven the house out of its mind and into the Gazette. For what would staid British responsibility and respectability 
have said to orange trees in boxes in a bank courtyard, and even to a cupid over the counter. Yet such things were. Telson's had whitewashed the cupid, but he was still to be seen on the ceiling, in the coolest linen, aiming, as he very often does, at money from morning to night. Bankruptcy must inevitably have come of this young pagan in Lombard Street, London, and also of a curtained alcove in the rear of the immortal boy, and also of a looking-glass let into the wall, and also of clerks not at all old, who danced in public on the slightest provocation. Yet, a French Telsons could get on with these things exceedingly well, and, as long as the times held together, no man had taken fright at them and drawn out his money. What money would be drawn out of Telsons henceforth, and would lie there lost and forgotten, what plate and jewels would tarnish in Telson's hiding places, while the depositors rusted in prisons, and when they should have violently perished, how many accounts with Telson's, never to be balanced in this world, must be carried over into the next. No man could have said that night any more than Mr. Jarvis Lorry could, though he thought heavily of these questions. He sat by a newly lighted wood fire, the blighted and unfruitful year was prematurely cold, and on his honest and courageous face there was a deeper shade than the pendant lamp could throw, or any object in the room distortedly reflect, a shade of horror. He occupied rooms in the bank in his fidelity to the house of which he had grown to be a part, like strong root ivy. It chanced that they derived a kind of security from the patriotic occupation of the main building, but the true-hearted old gentleman never calculated about that. All such circumstances were indifferent to him, so that he did his duty. On the opposite side of the courtyard, under a colonnade, was extensive standing for carriages, where indeed some carriages of Monseigneur yet stood. Against two of the pillars were fastened two great flaring flambeaux, and in the light of these, standing out in the open air, was a large grindstone a roughly mounted thing which appeared to have hurriedly been brought there from some neighbouring smithy or other workshop. Rising and looking out of window at these harmless objects, Mr. Lorry shivered and retired to his seat by the fire. He had opened not only the glass window, but the lattice blind outside it, and he had closed both again, and he shivered through his frame. From the streets beyond the high wall and the strong gate, there came the usual night hum of the city with now and then an indescribable ring in it, weird and unearthly, as if some unwanted sounds of a terrible nature were going up to heaven. Thank God, said Mr. Lorry, clasping his hands, that no one near and dear to me is in this dreadful town to-night. May he have mercy on all who are in danger. Soon afterwards the bell at the great gate sounded, and he thought, they have come back, and sat listening but there was no loud eruption into the courtyard, as he had expected, and he heard the gate clash again, and all was quiet. The nervousness and dread that were upon him inspired that vague uneasiness respecting the bank, which a great change would naturally awaken, with such feelings roused. It was well guarded, and he got up to go among the trusty people who were watching it, when his door suddenly opened, and two figures rushed in, at sight of which he fell back in amazement, Lucy and her father. Lucy with her arms stretched out to him, and with that old look of earnestness so concentrated and intensified that it seemed as though it had been stamped upon her face expressly to give force and power to it in this one passage of her life. "'What is this?' cried Mr. Lorry, breathless and confused. "'What is the matter, Lucy? Manette, what has happened? What has brought you here? What is it?' With the look fixed upon him in her paleness and wildness, she panted out in his arms imploringly, Oh, my dear friend, my husband, your husband, Lucy? Charles, what of Charles? Here, here, in Paris? Has been here some days, three or four, I don't know how many, I can't collect my thoughts. An errand of generosity brought him here unknown to us. He was stopped at the barrier and sent to prison the old man uttered an irrepressible cry. Almost at the same moment, the bell of the great gate rang again, and a loud noise of feet and voices came pouring into the courtyard. "'What is that noise?' said the doctor, turning towards the window. 
Don't look, cried Mr. Lorry. Don't look out, Minette. For your life, don't touch the blind. The doctor turned with his hand upon the fastening of the window, and said with a cool, bold smile, My dear friend, I have a charmed life in this city. I have been a Bastille prisoner. There is no patriot in Paris. In Paris? In France. Who, knowing me to have been a prisoner in the Bastille, would touch me, except to overwhelm me with embraces or carry me in triumph. My old pain has given me a power that has brought us through the barrier, and gained us news of Charles there, and brought us here. I knew it would be so. I knew I could help Charles out of all danger. I told Lucy so. What is that noise? His hand was again upon the window. Don't look, cried Mr. Lorry, absolutely desperate. No, Lucy, my dear, nor you. He got his arm round her and held her. Don't be so terrified, my love. I solemnly swear to you that I know of no harm having happened to Charles, that I had no suspicion even of his being in this fatal place. What prison is he in? La Force! La Force! Lucy, my child, if ever you were brave and serviceable in your life, and you were always both, you will compose yourself now to do exactly as I bid you, for more depends upon it than you can think or I can say. There is no help for you in any action on your part tonight. You cannot possibly stir out. I say this because what I must bid you to do for Charles's sake is the hardest thing to do of all. You must instantly be obedient, still, and quiet. You must let me put you in a room at the back here. You must leave your father and me alone for two minutes, and as there are life and death in the world, you must not delay. I will be submissive to you. I see in your face that you know I can do nothing else than this. I know you are true. The old man kissed her and hurried her into his room and turned the key. Then came hurrying back to the doctor and opened the window and partly opened the blind and put his hand upon the doctor's arm and looked out with him into the courtyard. Looked out upon a throng of men and women, not enough in number or near enough to fill the courtyard, not more than forty or fifty in all. The people in possession of the house had let them in at the gate, and they had rushed in to work at the grindstone. It had evidently been set up there for their purpose, as in a convenient and retired spot. But such awful workers, and such awful work. The grindstone had a double handle, and, turning at it madly, were two men, whose faces, as their long hair flapped back when the whirlings of the grindstone brought their faces up, were more horrible and cruel than the visages of the wildest savages in their most barbarous disguise. False eyebrows and false moustaches were stuck upon them, and their hideous countenances were all bloody and sweaty, and all awry with howling, and all staring and glaring with beastly excitement and want of sleep. As these ruffians turned and turned, their matted locks now flung forward over their eyes, now flung backward over their necks, some women held wine to their mouths that they might drink, and what with dropping blood, and what with dropping wine, and what with the stream of sparks struck out of the stone, all their wicked atmosphere seemed gore and fire. The eye could not detect one creature in the group free from the smear of blood. Shouldering one another to get next at the sharpening stone were men stripped to the waist with the stain all over their limbs and bodies, men in all sorts of rags, with the stain upon those rags. Men devilishly set off with spoils of women's lace and silk and ribbon, with the stain dyeing those trifles through and through. Hatchets, knives, bayonets, swords, all brought to be sharpened, were all red with it. Some of the hacked swords were tied to the wrists of those who carried them, with strips of linen and fragments of dress. Ligatures various in kind, but all deep of the one colour and as the frantic wielders of these weapons snatched them from the stream of sparks and tore away into the streets, the same red hue was red in their frenzied eyes, eyes which any unbrutalized beholder would have given twenty years of life to petrify with a well-directed gun. All this was seen in a moment as the vision of a drowning man, or of any human creature, at any very great pass, could see a world if it were there. They drew back from the window, and the doctor looked for explanation in his friend's ashy face. They are, 
Mr. Lorry whispered the words, glancing fearfully round at the locked room, murdering the prisoners. If you are sure of what you say, if you really have the power you think you have, as I believe you have, make yourself known to these devils, and get taken to La Force. It may be too late, I don't know, but let it not be a minute later. Dr. Manette pressed his hand, hastened bareheaded out of the room, and was in the courtyard when Mr. Lorry regained the blind. His streaming white hair, his remarkable face, and the impetus confidence of his manner, as he put the weapons aside like water, carried him in an instant to the heart of the concourse at the stone. For a few moments there was a pause, and a hurry and a murmur, and the unintelligible sound of his voice, and then Mr. Lorry saw him, surrounded by all, and in the midst of a line of twenty men long, all linked shoulder to shoulder and hand to shoulder, hurried out with cries of, Live the Bastille prisoner! Help for the Bastille prisoners kindred in La Force! Room for the Bastille prisoner in front there! Save the prisoner Evremond at La Force! And a thousand answering shouts. He closed the lattice again with a fluttering heart, closed the window and the curtain, hastened to Lucy, and told her that her father was assisted by the people, and gone in search of her husband. He found her child and Miss Pross with her, but it never occurred to him to be surprised by their appearance, until a long time afterwards, when he sat watching them in such quiet as the night knew. Lucy had, by that time, fallen into a stupor on the floor at his feet, clinging to his hand. Miss Pross had laid the child down on his own bed, and her head had gradually fallen on the pillow beside her pretty charge. Oh, the long, long night, with the moans of the poor wife! Oh, the long, long night, with no return of her father, and no tidings! Twice more in the darkness, the bell at the great gate sounded, and the eruption was repeated, and the grindstone whirled and sputtered. What is it? cried Lucy, affrighted. Hush, the soldiers' swords are sharpened there, said Mr. Lorry. The place is national property now and used as a kind of armoury, my love, twice more in all, but the last spell of work was feeble and fitful. Soon afterwards the day began to dawn, and he softly detached himself from the clasping hand, and cautiously looked out again. A man, so besmeared that he might have been a sorely wounded soldier, creeping back to consciousness on a field of slain, was rising from the pavement by the side of the grindstone, and looking about him with a vacant air. Shortly this worn-out murderer descried in the imperfect light one of the carriages of Monseigneur, and, staggering to that gorgeous vehicle, climbed in at the door and shut himself up to take his rest on its dainty cushions. The great grindstone, earth had turned when Mr. Lorry looked out again, and the sun was red on the courtyard. But the lesser grindstone stood alone there in the calm morning air, with a red upon it that the sun had never given and would never take away. Chapter 3 The Shadow One of the first considerations which arose in the business mind of Mr. Lorry, when business hours came round, was this, that he had no right to imperil Telson's by sheltering the wife of an emigrant prisoner under the bank roof. His own possessions, safety, life he would have hazarded for Lucy and her child without a moment's demur, but the great trust he held was not his own, and to that business charge he was a strict man of business. At first his mind reverted to Defarge, and he thought of finding out the wine shop again and taking counsel with its master in reference to the safest dwelling place in the distracted state of the city. But the same consideration that suggested him repudiated him. He lived in the most violent quarter, and doubtless was influential there, and deep in its dangerous workings. Noon coming, and the doctor not returning, and every minute's delay tending to compromise Telson's, Mr. Lorry advised with Lucy. She said that her father had spoken of hiring a lodging for a short term in that quarter, near the banking house. As there were no business objection to this, and he foresaw that even if it were all well with Charles, and he were to be released, he could not hope to leave the city. Mr. Lorry went out in quest of such a lodging, and found a suitable one, high up in a removed by-street, 
where the closed blinds in all the other windows of a high melancholy square of buildings marked deserted homes. To this lodging, he at once removed Lucy and her child, and Miss Pross, giving them what comfort he could, and much more than he had himself. He left Jerry with them, as a figure to fill a doorway that would bear considerable knocking on the head, and returned to his own occupations, a disturbed and doleful mind he brought to bear upon them, and slowly and heavily the day lagged on with him. It wore itself out, and wore him out with it, until the bank closed. He was again alone in his room of the previous night, considering what to do next, when he heard a foot upon the stair. In a few moments a man stood in his presence, who, with a keenly observant look at him, addressed him by his name. "'Your servant,' said Mr. Lorry. "'Do you know me?' He was a strongly made man with dark curling hair from forty-five to fifty years of age. For answer he repeated, without any emphasis, the words, "'Do you know me? I have seen you somewhere. Perhaps at my wine-shop.' Much interested and agitated, Mr. Lorry said, "'You come from Dr. Manette?' "'Yes, I come from Dr. Manette. And what says he? What does he send me?' Defarge gave into his anxious hand an open scrap of paper. It bore the words in the doctor's writing, "'Charles is safe, but I cannot safely leave this place yet. I have obtained the favour that the bearer has a short note from Charles to his wife. Let the bearer see his wife.' It was dated from La Force within an hour. "'Will you accompany me?' said Mr. Lorry, joyfully relieved after reading this note aloud, to where his wife resides. "'Yes,' returned Defarge. Scarcely noticing as yet, in what a curiously reserved and mechanical way Defarge spoke, Mr. Lorry put on his hat, and they went down into the courtyard. There they found two women, one knitting. "'Madame Defarge, surely!' said Mr. Lorry, who had left her in exactly the same attitude some seventeen years ago. "'It is she,' observed her husband. "'Does Madame go with us?' inquired Mr. Lorry, seeing that she moved as they moved. "'Yes, that she may be able to recognise the faces and know the persons. It is for their safety.' Beginning to be struck by Defarge's manner, Mr. Lorry looked dubiously at him, and led the way. Both the women followed, the second woman being the vengeance. They passed through the intervening streets as quickly as they might, ascended the staircase of the new domicile, were attended by Jerry, and found Lucy weeping alone. She was thrown into a transport by the tidings Mr. Lorry gave her of her husband, and clasped the hand that delivered his note, little thinking what it had been doing near him in the night, and might, but for a chance, have done to him. Dearest, take courage, I am well, and your father has influence around me. You cannot answer this. Kiss our child for me. That was all the writing. It was so much, however, to her who received it, that she turned from Defarge to his wife, and kissed one of the hands that knitted. It was a passionate, loving, thankful, womanly action. But the hand made no response, dropped cold and heavy, and took to its knitting again. There was something in its touch that gave Lucy a check. She stopped in the act of putting the note in her bosom, and, with her hands yet at her neck, looked terrified at Madame Defarge. Madame Defarge met the lifted eyebrows and forehead with a cold, impassive stare. "'My dear,' said Mr. Lorry, striking in to explain, "'there are frequent risings in the streets, and, although it is not likely they will ever trouble you, Madame Defarge wishes to see those whom she has the power to protect at such times, to the end that she may know them, that she may identify them, I believe, said Mr. Lorry, rather halting in his reassuring words, as the stony manner of all three impressed themselves upon him more and more. I state the case, Citizen Defarge? Defarge looked gloomily at his wife, and gave no other answer than a gruff sound of acquiescence. You had better, Lucy? said Mr. Lorry, doing all he could to propitiate, by tone and manner. Have the dear child here, and our good Pross. Our good Pross Defarge is an English lady, and knows no French. The lady in question, whose rooted conviction that she was more than a match for any foreigner, was not to be shaken by distress and danger, appeared with folded arms, and observed in English 
to the vengeance whom her eyes first encountered. Well, I am sure, bold face, I hope you are pretty well. She also bestowed a British cough on Madame Defarge, but neither of the two took much heed of her. Is that his child? said Madame Defarge, stopping in her work for the first time, and pointing her knitting needle at little Lucy, as if it were the finger of fate. Yes, madame, answered Mr. Lorry. This is our poor prisoner's darling daughter and only child. The shadow attendant on Madame Defarge and her party seemed to fall so threateningly and dark on the child that her mother instinctively kneeled on the ground beside her and held her to her breast. The shadow attendant on Madame Defarge and her party seemed then to fall, threatening and dark, on both the mother and the child. It is enough, my husband, said Madame Defarge. I have seen them, we may go. But the suppressed manner had enough of menace in it, not visible and presented, but indistinct and withheld, to alarm Lucy into saying, as she laid her appealing hand on Madame Defarge's dress, You will be good to my poor husband. You will do him no harm. You will help me to see him if you can. Your husband is not my business here, returned Madame Defarge, looking down at her with perfect composure. It is the daughter of your father who is my business here. For my sake, then, be merciful to my husband, for my child's sake. She will put her hands together and pray you to be merciful. We are more afraid of you than of these others. Madame Defarge received it as a compliment, and looked at her husband. Defarge, who had been uneasily biting his thumbnail and looking at her, collected his face into a sterner expression. What is it that your husband says in that little letter? asked Madame Defarge with a lowering smile. Influence. He says something touching influence? That my father, said Lucy, hurriedly taking the paper from her breast, but with her alarmed eyes on her questioner and not on it, has much influence around him. Surely it will release him, said Madame Defarge. Let it do so. As a wife and mother, cried Lucy most earnestly, I implore you to have pity on me, and not to exercise any power that you possess against my innocent husband, but to use it on his behalf. Oh, sister woman, think of me as a wife and mother. Madame Defarge looked, coldly as ever, at the suppliant, and said, turning to her friend the vengeance, The wives and mothers we have been used to see, since we were as little as this child and much less, have not been greatly considered? We have known their husbands and fathers laid in prison and kept from them often enough. All our lives we have seen our sister women suffer, in themselves and in their children, poverty, nakedness, hunger, thirst, sickness, misery, oppression and neglect of all kinds. We have seen nothing else, returned the vengeance. We have borne this a long time, said Madame Defarge, turning her eyes again upon Lucy. Judge you. Is it likely that the trouble of one wife and mother would be much to us now? She resumed her knitting and went on. The vengeance followed. Defarge went last and closed the door. Courage, my dear Lucy, said Mr. Lorry as he raised her. Courage, courage. So far all goes well with us, much, much better than it has of late gone with many poor souls. Cheer up and have a thankful heart. I am not thankless. I hope, but that dreadful woman seems to throw a shadow on me and on all my hopes. Tut, tut, said Mr. Lorry. What is this despondency in the brave little breast? A shadow, indeed. No substance in it, Lucy. But the shadow of the manner of these defages was dark upon himself for all that, and in his secret mind it troubled him greatly. Chapter 4. Calm in Storm Dr. Manette did not return until the morning of the fourth day of his absence. So much of what had happened in that dreadful time as could be kept from the knowledge of Lucy was so well concealed from her, that not until long afterwards, when France and she were far apart, did she know that eleven hundred defenceless prisoners of both sexes and all ages had been killed by the populace that four days and nights had been darkened by this deed of horror, and that the air around her had been tainted by the slain. She only knew that there had been an attack upon the prisons, and that political prisoners had been in danger, and that some had been dragged out by the crowd and murdered. 
To Mr. Lorry, the doctor communicated under an injunction of secrecy on which he had no need to dwell that the crowd had taken him through a scene of carnage to the prison of La Force, that in the prison he had found a self-appointed tribunal sitting before which the prisoners were brought singly and by which they were rapidly ordered to be put forth to be massacred, or to be released, or, in a few cases, to be sent back to their cells. That, presented by his conductors to this tribunal, he had announced himself by name and profession as having been for eighteen years a secret and unaccused prisoner in the Bastille, that one of the bodies so sitting in judgment had risen and identified him, and that this man was Defarge. That hereupon he had ascertained, through the registers on the table, that his son-in-law was among the living prisoners, and had pleaded hard to the tribunal, of whom some members were asleep and some awake, some dirty with murder, and some clean, some sober, and some not, for his life and liberty. That in the first frantic greetings lavished on himself as a notable sufferer under the overthrown system, it had been accorded to him to have Charles Darnay brought before the lawless court and examined, that he seemed on the point of being at once released when the tide in his favour met with some unexplained check, not intelligible to the doctor, which led to a few words of secret confidence, that the man sitting as president had then informed Dr. Manette that the prisoner must remain in custody, but should, for his sake, be held inviolate in safe custody, that immediately, on a signal, the prisoner was removed to the interior of the prison again, but that he, the doctor, had then so strongly pleaded for permission to remain and assure himself that his son-in-law was, through no malice or mischance, delivered to the concourse whose murderous yells outside the gate had often drowned the proceedings, that he had obtained the permission and had remained in that hall of blood until the danger was over. The sights he had seen there. What brief snatches of food and sleep by intervals shall remain untold. The mad joy over the prisoners who were saved had astounded him scarcely less than the mad ferocity against those who were cut to pieces. One prisoner there was, he said, who had been discharged into the street free, but at whom a mistaken savage had thrust a pike as he passed out. Being besought to go to him and dress the wound, the doctor had passed out at the same gate, and had found him in the arms of a company of Samaritans, who were seated on the bodies of their victims. With an inconsistency as monstrous as anything in this awful nightmare, they had helped the healer, and tended the wounded man with the gentlest solicitude, had made a litter for him, and escorted him carefully from the spot, had then caught up their weapons, and plunged anew into a butchery so dreadful that the doctor had covered his eyes with his hands, and swooned away in the midst of it. As Mr. Lorry received these confidences, and as he watched the face of his friend now sixty-two years of age, a misgiving arose within him that such dread experiences would revive the old danger. But he had never seen his friend in his present aspect. He had never at all known him in his present character. For the first time, the doctor felt now that his suffering was strength and power. For the first time, He felt that, in that sharp fire, he had slowly forged the iron which could break the prison door of his daughter's husband and deliver him. It all tended to a good end, my friend. It was not mere waste and ruin. As my beloved child was helpful in restoring me to myself, I will be helpful now in restoring the dearest part of herself to her. By the aid of heaven, I will do it. Thus. Dr. Manette. And when Jarvis Lorry saw the kindled eyes, the resolute face, the calm, strong look, and bearing of the man whose life always seemed to him to have been stopped like a clock for so many years, and then set going again with an energy which had lain dormant during the cessation of its usefulness, he believed. Greater things than the doctor had at that time to contend with would have yielded before his persevering purpose. While he kept himself in his place as a physician, whose business was, with all degrees of mankind, bond and free, rich and poor, bad and good, he used his personal influence so wisely 
that he was soon the inspecting physician of three prisons, and among them of La Force. He could now assure Lucy that her husband was no longer confined alone, but was mixed with the general body of prisoners. He saw her husband weekly and brought sweet messages to her, straight from his lips. Sometimes her husband himself sent a letter to her, though never by the doctor's hand, but she was not permitted to write to him, for among the many wild suspicions of plots in the prisons, the wildest of all pointed at emigrants who were known to have made friends or permanent connections abroad. This new life of the doctor's was an anxious life, no doubt. Still, the sagacious Mr. Lorry saw that there was a new sustaining pride in it. Nothing unbecoming tinged the pride. It was a natural and worthy one, but he observed it as a curiosity. The doctor knew that up to that time his imprisonment had been associated in the minds of his daughter and his friend with his personal affliction, deprivation, and weakness. Now that this was changed, and he knew himself to be invested through that old trial with forces to which they both looked for Charles's ultimate safety and deliverance, he became so far exalted by the change that he took the lead and direction, and required them as the weak to trust to him as the strong. The preceding relative positions of himself and Lucy were reversed, yet only as the liveliest gratitude and affection could reverse them for he could have had no pride but in rendering some service to her who had rendered so much to him. All curious to see, thought Mr. Lorry in his amiably shrewd way, but all natural and right. So take the lead, my dear friend, and keep it. It couldn't be in better hands. But though the doctor tried hard, and never ceased trying to get Charles Darnay set at liberty, or at least to get him brought to trial, the public current of the time set too strong and fast for him. The new era began. The king was tried, doomed, and beheaded. The republic of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death declared for victory or death against the world in arms. The black flag waved night and day from the great towers of Notre Dame. Three hundred thousand men summoned to rise against the tyrants of the earth, rose from all the varying soils of France, as if the dragon's teeth had been sown broadcast, and had yielded fruit equally on hill and plain, on rock, in gravel, and alluvial mud, under the bright sky of the south and under the clouds of the north, in fell and forest, in the vineyards and old olive grounds, and among the cropped grass and the stubble of the corn, along the fruitful banks of the broad rivers, and in the sand of the seashore. What private solicitude could rear itself against the deluge of the year one of liberty? The deluge rising from below, not falling from above, and with the windows of heaven shut, not opened. There was no pause, no pity, no peace, no interval of relenting rest, no measurement of time. Though days and nights circled as regularly as when time was young, and the evening and morning were the first day, other count of time there was none. Hold of it was lost in the raging fever of a nation, as it is in the fever of one patient. Now breaking the unnatural silence of a whole city, the executioner showed the people the head of the king, and now it seemed almost in the same breath the head of his fair wife, which had had eight weary months of imprisoned widowhood and misery, to turn it grey. And yet observing the strange law of contradiction which obtains in all such cases, the time was long, while it flamed by so fast. A revolutionary tribunal in the capital, and forty or fifty thousand revolutionary committees all over the land. A law of the suspected, which struck away all security for liberty or life, and delivered over any good and innocent person to any bad and guilty one. Prisons gorged with people who had committed no offence, and could obtain no hearing. These things became the established order and nature of appointed things, and seemed to be ancient usage before they were many weeks old. Above all, one hideous figure grew as familiar 
as if it had been before the general gaze, from the foundations of the world, the figure of the sharp female called La Guillotine. It was the popular theme for jests. It was the best cure for headache. It infallibly prevented the hair from turning grey. It imparted a particular delicacy to the complexion. It was the national razor which shaved close, who kissed La Guillotine, looked through the little window, and sneezed into the sack. It was the sign of the regeneration of the human race. It superseded the cross. Models of it were worn on breasts from which the cross was discarded, and it was bowed down to and believed in where the cross was denied. It sheared off heads so many that it and the ground it most polluted was a rotten red. It was taken to pieces like a toy puzzle for a young devil, and was put together again when the occasion wanted it. It hushed the eloquent, struck down the powerful, abolished the beautiful and good. Twenty-two friends of high public mark, twenty-one living and one dead, it had lopped the heads off in one morning, in as many minutes. The name of the strong man of old scripture had descended to the chief functionary who worked it, but so armed he was stronger than his namesake, and blinder, and tore away at the gates of God's own temple every day. Among these terrors and the brood belonging to them, the doctor walked with a steady head, confident in his power, cautiously persistent in his end, never doubting that he would save Lucy's husband at last. Yet the current of the time swept by, so strong and deep, and carried the time away so fiercely that Charles had lain in prison one year and three months when the doctor was thus steady and confident. So much more wicked and distracted had the revolution grown in that December month, that the rivers of the south were encumbered with the bodies of the violently drowned by night, and prisoners were shot in lines and squares under the northern wintry sun. Still, the doctor walked among the terrors with a steady head. No man better known than he in Paris at that day, no man in a stranger situation. Silent, humane, indispensable in hospital and prison, using his art equally among assassins and victims, he was a man apart. In the exercise of his skill, the appearance and the story of the Bastille captive removed him from all other men. He was not suspected or brought in question any more than if he had indeed been recalled to life some eighteen years before, or were a spirit moving among mortals. Chapter 5 The Woodsawer One year and three months. During all that time, Lucy was never sure, from hour to hour, but the guillotine would strike off her husband's head next day. Every day through the stony streets, the tumbrils now jolted heavily, filled with condemned. Lovely girls, bright women, brown-haired, black-haired and grey, youths, stalwart men and old, gentle-born and peasant-born, all red wine for la guillotine. All daily brought into light from the dark cellars of the loathsome prisons, and carried to her through the streets to slake her devouring thirst. Liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, the last much the easiest to bestow, O guillotine. If the suddenness of her calamity and the whirling wheels of the time had stunned the doctor's daughter into awaiting the result in idle despair, it would but have been with her as it was with many. But from the hour when she had taken the white head to her fresh young bosom in the garret of Saint Antoine, she had been true to her duties. She was truest to them in the season of trial, as all the quietly loyal and good will always be. As soon as they were established in their new residence, and her father had entered on the routine of his avocations, she arranged the little household as exactly as if her husband had been there. Everything had its appointed place and its appointed time. Little Lucy she taught, as regularly, 
as if they had all been united in their English home. The slight devices with which she cheated herself into the show of a belief that they would soon be reunited, the little preparations for his speedy return, the setting aside of his chair and his books, these, and the solemn prayer at night for one dear prisoner especially, among the many unhappy souls in prison and the shadow of death, were almost the only outspoken reliefs of her heavy mind. She did not greatly alter in appearance, the plain dark dresses akin to mourning dresses, which she and her child wore, were as neat and as well attended to as the brighter clothes of happy days. She lost her colour, and the old and intent expression was a constant, not an occasional thing. However, she remained very pretty and comely. Sometimes at night, on kissing her father, she would burst into the grief she had repressed all day, and would say that her sole reliance under heaven was on him. He always resolutely answered, Nothing can happen to him without my knowledge, and I know I can save him, Lucy. They had not made the round of their changed life many weeks, when her father said to her, on coming home one evening, My dear, there is an upper window in the prison, to which Charles can sometimes gain access at three in the afternoon. When he can get to it, which depends on many uncertainties and incidents, he might see you in the street, he thinks, if you stood in a certain place that I can show you. But you will not be able to see him, my poor child, and even if you could, it would be unsafe for you to make a sign of recognition. Oh, show me the place, my father, and I will go there every day. From that time, in all weathers, she waited there two hours. As the clock struck two, she was there, and at four, she turned resignedly away. When it was not too wet or inclement for her child to be with her, they went together. At other times, she was alone, but she never missed a single day. It was the dark and dirty corner of a small winding street, the hovel of a cutter of wood into lengths for burning, was the only house at that end. All else was wall. On the third day of her being there, he noticed her. Good day, citizeness. Good day, citizen. The mode of address was now prescribed by decree. It had been established voluntarily some time ago among the more thorough patriots, but was now law for everybody. Walking here again, citizeness. You see me, citizen. The wood sawyer, who was a little man with a redundancy of gesture, he had once been a mender of roads, cast a glance at the prison, pointed at the prison, and putting his ten fingers before his face to represent bars, peeped through them jocosely. But that's not my business, said he, and he went on sawing his wood. Next day he was looking out for her, and accosted her the moment she appeared. What, walk in here again, citizeness? Yes, citizen. Ah, a child too. Your mother is it not, my little citizeness? Do I say yes, mamma? whispered little Lucy, drawing close to her. Yes, dearest. Yes, citizen. Ah, but it is not my business. My work is my business. See my saw. I call it my little guillotine. La 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 la, and off his head comes. The billet fell as he spoke, and he threw it into a basket. I call myself the Samson of the firewood guillotine. See here again. Lo 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 lo, and off her head comes. Now a child. Tickle, tickle, pickle, pickle and off its head comes, all the family. Lucy shuddered as he threw two more billets into his basket, but it was impossible to be there while the wood sawyer was at work, and not be in his sight. Thenceforth, to secure his good will, she always spoke to him first, and often gave him drink money, which he readily received. He was an inquisitive fellow, and sometimes when she had quite forgotten him in gazing at the prison roof and grates, and in lifting her heart up to her husband, she would come to herself to find him looking at her, with his knee on his bench and his saw stopped in his work. But it is not my business, he would generally say at those times, and would briefly fall to his sawing again. In all weathers, in the snow and frost of winter, in the bitter winds of spring, in the hot sunshine of summer, in the rains of autumn, and again in the snow and frost of winter, Lucy passed two hours of every day at this place, and every day on leaving it, she kissed the prison wall. Her husband saw her, so she learned from her father, 
it might be once in five or six times, twice or thrice running, it might be not for a week or a fortnight together. It was enough that he could and did see her when the chances served, and on that possibility she would have waited out the day seven days a week. These occupations brought her round to the December month, wherein her father walked among the terrors with a steady head. On a lightly snowing afternoon she arrived at the usual corner. It was a day of some wild rejoicing and a festival. She had seen the houses, as she came along, decorated with little pikes and with little red caps stuck upon them, also with tricoloured ribbons, also with the standard inscription. Tricoloured letters were the favourite. Republic, one and indivisible. Liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. The miserable shop of the wood sawyer was so small that its whole surface furnished very indifferent space for this legend. He had got somebody to scrawl it up for him, however, who had squeezed death in with most inappropriate difficulty. On his housetop he displayed pike and cap, as a good citizen must, and in a window he had stationed his saw, inscribed as his little Saint Guillotine, for the great sharp female was by that time popularly canonised. His shop was shut and he was not there, which was a relief to Lucy, and left her quite alone. But he was not far off, for presently she heard a troubled movement and a shouting coming along, which filled her with fear. A moment afterwards and a throng of people came pouring round the corner by the prison wall, in the midst of whom was the wood saw hand in hand with the vengeance. There could not be fewer than five hundred people, and they were dancing like five thousand demons. There was no other music than their own singing. They danced to the popular revolution song, keeping a ferocious time that was like a gnashing of teeth in unison. Men and women danced together. Women danced together. Men danced together as Hazard had brought them together. At first, they were a mere storm of coarse red caps and coarse woolen rags, but as they filled the place and stopped to dance about Lucy, some ghastly apparition of a dance figure gone raving mad arose among them. They advanced, retreated, struck at one another's hands, clutched at another's heads, spun round alone, caught one another and spun round in pairs until many of them dropped. While those were down, the rest linked hand in hand and all spun round together. Then the ring broke, and in separate rings of two and four they turned and turned until they all stopped at once, began again, struck, clutched and tore, and then reversed the spin, and all spun round another way. Suddenly they stopped again, paused, struck out the time afresh, formed into lines the width of the public way, and with their heads low down and their hands high up, swooped screaming off. No fight could have been half so terrible as this dance. It was so emphatically a fallen sport, a something once innocent, delivered over to all devilry, a healthy pastime changed into a means of angering the blood, bewildering the senses, and stealing the heart. Such grace as was visible in it made it the uglier, showing how warped and perverted all things good by nature were become. The maidenly bosom bared to this, the pretty almost child's head thus distracted, the delicate foot mincing in this slough of blood and dirt, were types of the disjointed time. This was the Carmenole. As it passed, leaving Lucy frightened and bewildered in the doorway of the wood sawyer's house, the feathery snow fell as quietly and lay as white and soft as if it had never been. Oh, my father! for he stood before her when she lifted up the eyes she had momentarily darkened with her hand. Such a cruel, bad sight! I know, my dear, I know. I have seen it many times. Don't be frightened. Not one of them would harm you. I am not frightened for myself, my father, but when I think of my husband and the mercies of these people. We will set him above their mercies very soon. I left him climbing to the window, and I came to tell you. There is no one here to see. You may kiss your hand towards that higher shelving roof. I do so, father, and I send him my soul with it. You cannot see him, my poor dear? No, father, said Lucy, yearning and weeping as she kissed her hand. No. A footstep in the snow. Madame Defarge. I salute you, citizeness, from the doctor. I salute you, citizen. 
this in passing, nothing more, Madame Defarge gone like a shadow over the white road. Give me your arm, my love. Pass from here with an air of cheerfulness and courage for his sake. That was well done. They had left the spot. It shall not be in vain. Charles is summoned for tomorrow. For tomorrow! There is no time to lose. I am well prepared, but there are precautions to be taken that could not be taken until he was actually summoned before the tribunal. He has not received the notice yet, but I know that he will presently be summoned for tomorrow. And removed to the conciergery, I have timely information. You are not afraid? She could scarcely answer. I trust in you. Do so, implicitly. Your suspense is nearly ended, my darling. He shall be restored to you within a few hours. I have encompassed him with every protection. I must see Lorry. He stopped. There was a heavy lumbering of wheels within hearing. They both knew too well what it meant. One, two, three, three tumbrils, faring away with, with their dread loads over the hushing snow. I must see Lorry, the doctor repeated, turning her another way. The staunch old gentleman was still in his trust. He never left it. He and his books were in frequent requisition as to property confiscated and made national. What he could save for the owners, he saved. No better man living to hold fast by what Telson's had in keeping and to hold his peace. A murky red and yellow sky and a rising mist from the Seine denoted the approach of darkness. It was almost dark when they arrived at the bank. The stately residence of Monseigneur was altogether blighted and deserted. Above a heap of dust and ashes in the court ran the letters, National Property, Republic One and Indivisible, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, or Death. Who could that be with Mr. Lorry, the owner of the riding coat upon the chair, who must not be seen? From whom, newly arrived, did he come out? agitated and surprised, to take his favourite in his arms? To whom did he appear to repeat her faltering words when, raising his voice and turning his head towards the door of the room from which he had issued, he said, removed to the conciergery and summoned for tomorrow? Chapter 6 Triumph The dread tribunal of five judges, public prosecutor and determined jury, sat every day. Their lists went forth every evening and were read out by the jailers of the various prisons to their prisoners. The standard jailer joke was, Come out and listen to the evening paper. You're inside there. Charles Evremond, called Darnay. So at last began the evening paper at La Force. When a name was called, its owner stepped apart into a spot reserved for those who were announced as being thus fatally recorded. Charles Evremont, called Darnay, had reason to know the usage. He had seen hundreds pass away so. His bloated jailer, who wore spectacles to read with, glanced over them to assure himself that he had taken his place, and went through the list, making a similar short pause at each name. There were twenty-three names, but only twenty were responded to, for one of the prisoners so summoned had died in jail and been forgotten and two already been guillotined and forgotten. The list was read in the vaulted chamber where Darnay had seen the associated prisoners on the night of his arrival. Every one of those had perished in the massacre. Every human creature he had since cared for and parted with had died on the scaffold. There were hurried words of farewell and kindness, but the parting was soon over. It was the incident of every day, and the society of La Force were engaged in the preparation of some games of forfeits and a little concert for that evening. They crowded to the grates and shed tears there, but twenty places in the projected entertainments had to be refilled, and the time was, at best, short to the lock-up hour, when the common rooms and corridors would be delivered over to the great dogs who kept watch there through the night. The prisoners were far from insensible or unfeeling. Their ways arose out of the condition of the time. Similarly, though, with a subtle difference, a species of fervour or intoxication, known without doubt to have led some prisoners to brave the guillotine unnecessarily and to die by it, was not mere boastfulness, 
but a wild infection of the wildly shaken public mind. In seasons of pestilence, some of us will have a secret attraction to the disease, a terrible passing inclination to die of it. And all of us have like wonders hidden in our breasts, only needing circumstances to evoke them. The passage to the conciergery was short and dark. The night in its vermin-haunted cells was long and cold. Next day, fifteen prisoners were put to the bar before Charles Darnay's name was called. All the fifteen were condemned, and the trials of the whole occupied an hour and a half. Charles Evremond called Darnay was at length arraigned. His judges sat upon the bench in feathered hats, but the rough red cap and tricoloured cockade was the headdress otherwise prevailing. Looking at the jury and the turbulent audience, he might have thought that the usual order of things was reversed, and that the felons were trying the honest men, the lowest, cruelest and worst populace of a city, never without its quantity of low, cruel and bad, were the directing spirits of the scene, noisily commenting, applauding, disapproving, anticipating, and precipitating the result without a check. Of the men, the greater part there were armed in various ways. Of the women, some wore knives, some daggers, some ate and drank as they look on, many knitted. Among these last, the one, with a spare piece of knitting under her arm as she worked. She was in a front row by the side of a man whom he had never seen since his arrival at the barrier, but whom he directly remembered as Defarge. He noticed that she, once or twice, whispered in his ear, and that she seemed to be his wife. But what he most noticed in the two figures was, that although they were posted as close to himself as they could be, they never looked towards him. They seemed to be waiting for something with a dogged determination, and they looked at the jury, but at nothing else. Under the President sat Dr. Manette, in his usual quiet dress. As well as the prisoner could see, he and Mr. Lorry were the only men there, unconnected with the tribunal, who wore their usual clothes and had not assumed the coarse garb of the Carmenole. Charles Evremond, called Darnay, was accused by the public prosecutor as an emigrant, whose life was forfeit to the Republic under the decree which banished all emigrants on pain of death. It was nothing that the decree bore date since his return to France. There he was, and there was the decree. He had been taken in France, and his head was demanded. Take off his head, cried the audience. An enemy to the Republic! The President rang his bell to silence those cries, and asked the prisoner whether it was not true that he had lived many years in England. Undoubtedly it was. Was he not an emigrant then? What did he call himself? Not an emigrant, he hoped, within the sense and spirit of the law. Why not, the President desired to know. Because he had voluntarily relinquished a title that was distasteful to him, and a station that was distasteful to him, and had left his country, he submitted before the word emigrant, in the present exception by the tribunal, was in use, to live by his own industry in England, rather than on the industry of the overladen people of France. What proof had he of this? He handed the names of two witnesses, Théophile Gabel and Alexandre Manette. But he had married in England, the President reminded him. True, but not an English woman. A citizeness of France? Yes, by birth. Her name and family, Lucy Manette, only daughter of Dr. Manette, the good physician who sits there. The answer had a happy effect upon the audience. Cries in exultation of the well-known good physician rent the hall. So capriciously were the people moved that tears immediately rolled down several ferocious countenances which had been glaring at the prisoner a moment before, as if with impatience to pluck him out into the streets and kill him. On these few steps of his dangerous way, Charles Darnay had set his foot, according to Dr. Manette's reiterated instructions. The same cautious counsel directed every step that lay before him, and had prepared every inch of his road. The President asked why he had returned to France when he did, and not sooner. He had not returned sooner, he replied, simply because he had no means of living in France, save those he had resigned, whereas in England he lived by giving instruction in the French language and literature. He had returned when he did, 
on the pressing and written entreaty of a French citizen who represented that his life was endangered by his absence. He had come back to save a citizen's life and to bear his testimony at whatever personal hazard to the truth. Was that criminal in the eyes of the Republic? The populace cried enthusiastically, No! And the President rang his bell to quiet them, which it did not, for they continued to cry, No! until they left off of their own will. The President required the name of that citizen. The accused explained that the citizen was his first witness. He also referred with confidence to the citizen's letter, which had been taken from him at the barrier, but which, he did not doubt, would be found among the papers then before the President. The doctor had taken care that it should be there, had assured him that it would be there, and at this stage of the proceedings it was produced and read. Citizen Gabel was called to confirm it and did so. Citizen Gabel hinted, with infinite delicacy and politeness, that in the pressure of business imposed on the tribunal by the multitude of enemies of the Republic with which it had to deal, he had been slightly overlooked in his prison of the Abaye. In fact, he rather passed out of the tribunal's patriotic remembrance until three days ago, when he had been summoned before it and had been set at liberty on the juries declaring themselves satisfied that the accusation against him was answered, as to himself by the surrender of the citizen Evremond called Darnay. Dr. Manette was next questioned. His high personal popularity and the clearness of his answers made a great impression, but as he proceeded, as he showed that the accused was his first friend on his release from his long imprisonment, that the accused had remained in England, always faithful and devoted to his daughter and himself in their exile, that, so far from being in favour with the aristocrat government there, he had actually been tried for his life by it as the foe of England and friend of the United States, as he brought these circumstances into view with the greatest discretion and with the straightforward force of truth and earnestness, the jury and the populace became one. At last, when he appealed by name to Monsieur Lorry, an English gentleman then and there present, who, like himself, had been a witness on that English trial and could corroborate his account of it, the jury declared that they had heard enough and that they were ready with their votes if the President were content to receive them. At every vote, the jurymen voted aloud and individually, the populace set up a shout of applause. All the voices were in the prisoner's favour, and the President declared him free. Then began one of those extraordinary scenes with which the populace sometimes gratified their fickleness, or their better impulses towards generosity and mercy, or which they regarded as some set-off against their swollen account of cruel rage. No man can decide now to which of these motives such extraordinary scenes were referable. It is probable to a blending of all the three with the second predominating. No sooner was the acquittal pronounced than tears were shed as freely as blood at another time, and such fraternal embraces were bestowed upon the prisoner by as many of both sexes as could rush at him, that after his long and unwholesome confinement he was in danger of fainting from exhaustion. Nonetheless, because he knew very well that the very same people, carried by another current, would have rushed at him with the very same intensity to rend him to pieces and strew him over the streets. His removal, to make way for other accused persons who were to be tried, rescued him from these caresses for the moment. Five were to be tried together next, as enemies of the Republic, for as much as they had not assisted it by word or deed. So quick was the tribunal to compensate itself and the nation for a chance loss that these five came down to him before he left the place, condemned to die within twenty-four hours. The first of them told him so, with the customary prison sign of death, a raised finger, and they all added in words, Long live the Republic! The five had had, it is true, no audience to lengthen their proceedings, for when he and Dr. Manette emerged from the gate, there was a great crowd about it, in which there seemed to be every face he had seen in court, except two for which he looked in vain. On his coming out, the concourse made at him anew, weeping, embracing, and shouting, all by turns and all together, until the very tide of the river on the bank of which the mad scene was acted, seemed to run mad, 
like the people on the shore. They put him into a great chair they had among them, and which they had taken either out of the court itself or one of its rooms or passages. Over the chair they had thrown a red flag, and to the back of it they had bound a pike with a red cap on its top. In this car of triumph, not even the doctor's entreaties could prevent his being carried to his home on men's shoulders, with a confused sea of red caps heaving about him, and casting up to sight from the stormy deep such wrecks of faces that he more than once misdoubted his mind being in confusion, and that he was in the tumbril on its way to the guillotine. In wild, dreamlike procession, embracing whom they met and pointing him out, they carried him on, reddening the snowy streets with the prevailing Republican colour, in winding and tramping through them, as they had reddened them below the snow with a deeper dye. They carried him thus into the courtyard of the building where he lived. Her father had gone on before to prepare her, and when her husband stood upon his feet, she dropped insensible in his arms. As he held her to his heart and turned her beautiful head between his face and the brawling crowd, so that his tears and her lips might come together unseen, a few of the people fell to dancing. Instantly all the rest fell to dancing, and the courtyard overflowed with the carmenole. Then they elevated into the vacant chair a young woman from the crowd, to be carried as the goddess of liberty, and then swelling and overflowing out into the adjacent streets, and along the river's bank and over the bridge, the carmenole absorbed them every one, and whirled them away. After grasping the doctor's hand as he stood victorious and proud before him, after grasping the hand of Mr. Lorry, who came panting in, breathless from his struggle against the water sprout of the carmenole, after kissing little Lucy, who was lifted up to clasp her arms round his neck, after embracing the ever zealous and faithful Pross, who lifted her, he took his wife in his arms and carried her up to their rooms. Lucy, my own, I am safe. Oh, dearest Charles, let me thank God for this on my knees, as I have prayed to him. They all reverently bowed their heads and hearts. When she was again in his arms, he said to her, And now, speak to your father, dearest. No other man in all this France could have done what he has done for me. She laid her head upon her father's breast, as she had laid his poor head on her own breast, long, long ago. He was happy in the return he had made her. He was recompensed for his suffering. He was proud of his strength. You must not be weak, my darling, he remonstrated. Don't tremble so. I have saved him. Chapter 7 A Knock at the Door I have saved him. It was not another of the dreams in which he had often come back. He was really here. And yet his wife trembled, and a vague but heavy fear was upon her. All the air round was so thick and dark, the people were so passionately revengeful and fitful, the innocent were so constantly put to death on vague suspicion and black malice, it was so impossible to forget that many as blameless as her husband, and as dear to others as he was to her, every day shared the fate from which he had been clutched, that her heart could not be lightened of its load, as she felt it ought to be. The shadows of the wintry afternoon were beginning to fall, and even now the dreadful carts were rolling through the streets. Her mind pursued them, looking for him among the condemned, and then she clung closer to his real presence, and trembled more. Her father, cheering her, showed a compassionate superiority to this woman's weakness, which was wonderful to see. No garret, no shoemaking, no 105 North Tower now, he had accomplished the task he had set himself, his promise was redeemed, he had saved Charles. Let them all lean upon him. Their housekeeping was of a very frugal kind, not only because that was the safest way of life, involving the least offence to the people, but because they were not rich. 
and Charles, throughout his imprisonment, had had to pay heavily for his bad food and for his guard, and towards the living of the poorer prisoners. Partly on this account, and partly to avoid a domestic spy, they kept no servant. The citizen and citizeness who acted as porters at the courtyard gate rendered them occasional service, and Jerry, almost wholly transferred to them by Mr. Lorry, had become their daily retainer, and had his bed there every night. It was an ordinance of the Republic, one and indivisible of liberty, equality, fraternity or death, that on the door or doorpost of every house, the name of every inmate must be legibly inscribed in letters of a certain size, at a certain convenient height from the ground. Mr. Jerry Cruncher's name, therefore, duly embellished the doorpost down below, and, as the afternoon shadows deepened, the owner of that name himself appeared, from overlooking a painter whom Dr. Manette had employed to add to the list the name of Charles Evremond called Darnay. In the universal fear and distrust that darkened the time, all the usual harmless ways of life were changed. In the doctor's little household, as in very many others, the articles of daily consumption that were wanted were purchased every evening, in small quantities and at various small shops. To avoid attracting notice, and to give as little occasion as possible for talk and envy, was the general desire. For some months past, Miss Pross and Mr. Cruncher had discharged the office of purveyors, the former carrying the money, the latter the basket. Every afternoon, at about the time when the public lamps were lighted, they fared forth on this duty, and made and brought home such purchases as were needful. Although Miss Pross, through her long association with a French family, might have known as much of their language as of her own, if she had had a mind, she had no mind in that direction. Consequently, she knew no more of that nonsense, as she was pleased to call it, than Mr. Cruncher did. So her manner of marketing was to plump a noun, substantive, at the head of a shopkeeper, without any introduction in the nature of an article, and if it happened not to be the name of the thing she wanted, to look round for that thing, lay hold of it, and hold on by it until the bargain was concluded. She always made a bargain for it, by holding up, as a statement of its just price, one finger less than the merchant held up, whatever his number might be. Now, Mr. Cruncher, said Miss Pross, whose eyes were red with felicity, if you are ready, I am. Jerry hoarsely professed himself at Miss Pross's service. He had worn all his rust off long ago, but nothing would file his spiky head down. There's all manner of things wanted, said Miss Pross, and we have a precious time of it. We want wine, among the rest. Nice toasts these redheads will be drinking wherever we buy it. It'll be much the same to your knowledge, Miss, I should think, retorted Jerry, whether they drink your health or the old uns. Who's he? said Miss Pross. Mr. Cruncher, with some diffidence, explained himself as meaning Old Nicks. Old Nicks. Ha! said Miss Pross. It doesn't need an interpreter to explain the meaning of these creatures. They have but one, and it's midnight, murder, and mischief. Hush, dear, pray, pray be cautious, cried Lucy. Yes, 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 I'll be cautious, said Miss Pross. But I may say among ourselves that I do hope there will be no oniony and tobacco-y smotherings in the form of embracings all round, going on in the streets. Now, Ladybird, never you stir from that fire till I come back. Take care of the dear husband you have recovered, and don't move your pretty head from his shoulder as you have it now till you see me again. May I ask a question, Dr. Manette, before I go? I think you may take that liberty, the doctor answered, smiling. "'For gracious sake, don't talk about liberty. "'We have quite enough of that,' said Miss Pross. "'Hush, dear, again,' Lucy remonstrated. "'Well, my sweet,' said Miss Pross, nodding her head emphatically, "'the short and the long of it is that I am a subject of His Most Gracious Majesty King George the Third. "'Miss Pross curtsied at the name. "'And as such, my maxim is, "'confound their politics, frustrate their knavish tricks. "'On him our hopes we fix. God save the king. Mr. Cruncher, in an access of loyalty, growlingly repeated the words after Miss Pross, like somebody at church. I am glad you have so much of the Englishman in you, though I wish you had never taken that cold in your voice, said Miss Pross approvingly. 
But the question, Dr. Manette, is there... It was a good creature's way to affect to make light of anything that was a great anxiety with them all, and, to come at it in this chance manner, is there any prospect yet of our getting out of this place? I fear not yet. It would be dangerous for Charles yet. Hi ho hum, said Miss Pross, cheerfully repressing a sigh as she glanced at her darling's golden hair in the light of the fire. Then we must have patience and wait, that's all. We must hold up our heads and fight low, as my brother Solomon used to say. Now, Mr. Cruncher, don't you move, Lady Bird. They went out, leaving Lucy and her husband, her father and the child by a bright fire. Mr. Lorry was expected back presently from the banking house. Miss Pross had lighted the lamp, but had put it aside in a corner that they might enjoy the firelight undisturbed. Little Lucy sat by her grandfather with her hands clasped through his arm, and he, in a tone not rising much above a whisper, began to tell her a story of a great and powerful fairy who had opened a prison wall and let out a captive who had once done the fairy a service. All was subdued and quiet, and Lucy was more at ease than she had been. "'What is that?' she cried all at once. "'My dear,' said her father, stopping in his story and laying his hand on hers. Command yourself. What a disordered state you are in. The least thing, nothing startles you. You, your father's daughter. I thought, my father, said Lucy, excusing herself with a pale face and in a faltering voice, that I heard strange feet upon the stairs. My love, the staircase is as still as death. As he said the word, a blow was struck upon the door. Oh, father, father, what can this be? Hide, Charles, save him. My child, said the doctor, rising and laying his hand upon her shoulder. I have saved him. What weakness is this, my dear? Let me go to the door. He took the lamp in his hand, crossed the two intervening outer rooms, and opened it. A rude clattering of feet over the floor, and four rough men in red caps, armed with sabres and pistols, entered the room. "'The citizen Evremond called Darnay,' said the first. "'Who seeks him?' answered Darnay. "'I seek him. We seek him. I know you, Evremond. I saw you before the tribunal today. You are again the prisoner of the Republic.' The four surrounded him where he stood with his wife and child clinging to him. It is enough that you return straight to the conciergerie and will know tomorrow. You are summoned for tomorrow. Dr. Manette, whom this visitation had so turned into stone that he stood with the lamp in his hand as if he were a statue made to hold it, moved after these words were spoken, put the lamp down, and confronting the speaker and taking him not urgently by the loose front of his red woolen shirt said, You know him, you have said. Do you know me? Yes, I know you, citizen doctor. We all know you, citizen doctor, said the other three. He looked abstractly from one to another, and said in a lower voice, after a pause, Will you answer his question to me, then? How does this happen? Citizen doctor, said the first reluctantly, he has been denounced to the section of Saint-Antoine. This citizen, pointing out the second who had entered, is from Saint-Antoine. The citizen here indicated nodded his head and added, He is accused by Saint Antoine. Of what? asked the doctor. Citizen doctor, said the first with his former reluctance. Ask no more. If the Republic demands sacrifices from you, without doubt you as a good patriot will be happy to make them. The Republic goes before all. The people is supreme. Evremond, we are pressed. One word, the doctor entreated. Will you tell me who denounced him? It is against rule, answered the first, but you can ask him of Saint Antoine here. The doctor turned his eyes upon that man, who moved uneasily on his feet, rubbed his beard a little, and at length said, Well, truly it is against rule, but he is denounced, and gravely, by the citizen and citizeness Defarge, and by one other. What other do you ask, citizen doctor? Yes. Then, said he of Saint Antoine with a strange look, you will be answered tomorrow. Now I am dumb. Chapter 8 
A hand at cards. Happily unconscious of the new calamity at home, Miss Pross treaded her way along the narrow streets and crossed the river by the bridge of the Pont Neuf, reckoning in her mind the number of indispensable purchases she had to make. Mr. Cruncher, with the basket, walked at her side. They both looked to the right and to the left in most of the shops they passed, had a wary eye for all gregarious assemblages of people, and turned out of their road to avoid any very excited group of talkers. It was a raw evening, and the misty river blurred to the eye with blazing lights and to the ear with harsh noises, showed where the barges were stationed in which the smiths worked, making guns for the army of the Republic. Woe to the man who plays tricks with that army, or got undeserved promotion in it. Better for him that his beard had never grown, for the national razor shaved him close. Having purchased a few small articles of grocery and a measure of oil for the lamp, Miss Pross bethought herself of the wine they wanted. After peeping into several wine shops, she stopped at the sign of the good Republican Brutus of Antiquity, not far from the National Palace, once and twice the Tuileries, where the aspect of things rather took her fancy. It had a quieter look than any other place of the same description they had passed, and, though red with patriotic caps, was not so red as the rest. Sounding Mr. Cruncher and finding him of her opinion, Miss Pross resorted to the good Republican Brutus of Antiquity, attended by her cavalier, slightly observant of the smoky lights, of the people, pipe in mouth, playing with limp cards and yellow dominoes, of the one bare-breasted, bare-armed, suit-begrimed workman reading a journal aloud, and of the others listening to him, of the weapons worn, or laid aside to be resumed, of the two or three customers fallen forward asleep, who in popular high-shouldered shaggy black Spencer looked, in that attitude, like slumbering bears or dogs. The two outlandish customers approached the counter and showed what they wanted. As their wine was measuring out, a man parted from another man in a corner and rose to depart. In going, he had to face Miss Pross. No sooner did he face her than Miss Pross uttered a scream and clapped her hands. In a moment, the whole company were on their feet. That somebody was assassinated by somebody vindicating a difference of opinion was the likeliest occurrence. Everybody looked to see somebody fall but only saw a man and a woman standing, staring at each other. The man with all the outward aspect of a Frenchman and a thorough Republican, the woman evidently English. What was said in this disappointing anticlimax by the disciples of the good Republican Brutus of Antiquity, except that it was something very voluble and loud, would have been as so much Hebrew or Chaldean to Miss Pross and her protector, though they had been all ears but they had no ears for anything in their surprise. For, it must be recorded, though not only was Miss Pross lost in amazement and agitation, but Mr. Cruncher, though it seemed on his own, separate and individual account, was in a state of the greatest wonder. "'What is the matter?' said the man who caused Miss Pross to scream, speaking in a vexed, abrupt voice, though in a low tone, and in English. "'Oh, Solomon! Dear Solomon!' cried Miss Pross, clapping her hands again. After not setting eyes upon you or hearing of you for so long a time, do I find you here? Don't call me Solomon. Do you want to be the death of me? asked the man in a furtive, frightened way. Brother, brother, cried Miss Pross, bursting into tears. Have I ever been so hard with you that you ask me such a cruel question? Then hold your meddlesome tongue, said Solomon, and come out if you want to speak to me. Pay for your wine and come out. Who's this man? Miss Pross, shaking her loving and dejected head, at her by no means affectionate brother, said through her tears, Mr. Cruncher. Let him come out too, said Solomon. Does he think me a ghost? Apparently Mr. Cruncher did, to judge from his looks. He said not a word, however, and Miss Pross, exploring the depths of her reticule through her tears, with great difficulty, paid for her wine. As she did so, Solomon turned to the followers of the good Republican Brutus of Antiquity, and offered a few words of explanation in the French language, which caused them all to relapse into their former places and pursuits. Now, said Solomon, stopping at the dark street corner, what do you want? How 
dreadfully unkind in a brother nothing has ever turned my love away from, cried Miss Pross, to give me such a greeting and show me no affection. There, confound it, there, said Solomon, making a dab at Miss Pross's lips with his own. Now are you content? Miss Pross only shook her head and wept in silence. If you expect me to be surprised, said her brother Solomon, I am not surprised. I knew you were here. I know of most people who are here. If you really don't want to endanger my existence, which I half believe you do, go your ways as soon as possible and let me go mine. I am busy. I am an official. My English brother Solomon, mourned Miss Pross, casting up her tear-fraught eyes, that had the makings in him of one of the best and greatest of men in his native country, an official among foreigners, and such foreigners. I would almost sooner have seen my dear boy lying in his... I said so, cried her brother, interrupting. I knew it. You want to be the death of me. I shall be rendered suspect by my own sister, just as I am getting on. The gracious and merciful heavens forbid, cried Miss Pross. For rather would I never see you again, dear Solomon, though I have ever loved you truly and ever shall. Say but one affectionate word to me, and tell me there is nothing angry or estranged between us, and I will detain you no longer. Good Miss Pross, as if the estrangement between them had come of any culpability of hers, as if Mr. Lorry had not known it for a fact years ago in the quiet corner in Soho, that this precious brother had spent her money and left her. He was saying the affectionate word, however, with a far more grudging condescension and, and patronage than he could have shown if their relative merits and positions had been reversed, which is invariably the case all the world over, when Mr. Cruncher, touching him on the shoulder, hoarsely and unexpectedly interposed with the following singular question. I say, might I ask the favour as to whether your name is John Solomon or Solomon John? The official turned towards him with sudden distrust. He had not previously uttered a word. Come, said Mr. Cruncher, speak out, you know, which, by the way, was more than he could do himself. John Solomon or Solomon John, she calls you Solomon, and she must know, being your sister, and I know you're John, you know. Which of the two goes first? And regarding that name of Pross, likewise, that weren't your name over the water. What do you mean? Well, I don't know all I mean, for I can't call to mind what your name was over the water. No. No, but I'll swear it was a name of two syllables. Indeed. Yes, t'other ones was a syllable. I know you. You was a spy. Witness at the Bailey. What in the name of the father of lies, own father to yourself, was you called at that time? Barsad, said another voice striking in. That's the name for a thousand pound, cried Jerry. The speaker who struck in was Sidney Carton. He had his hands behind him under the skirts of his riding coat, and he stood at Mr. Cruncher's elbow as negligently as he might have stood at the old bailey itself. Don't be alarmed, my dear Miss Pross. I arrived at Mr. Lorry's to his surprise yesterday evening. We agreed that I would not present myself elsewhere until all was well, or unless I could be useful. I present myself here to beg a little talk with your brother. I wish you had a better employed brother than Mr. Bassard. I wish for your sake Mr. Barsard was not a sheep of the prisons. Sheep was a cant word of the time for a spy under the jailers. The spy, who was pale, turned paler, and asked him how he dared. I'll tell you, said Sidney. I lighted on you, Mr. Barsard, coming out of the prison of the conciergerie while I was contemplating the walls an hour or more ago. You have a face to be remembered and I remember faces well, made curious by seeing you in that connection and having a reason, to which you are no stranger, for associating you with the misfortunes of a friend, now very unfortunate, I walked in your direction. I walked into the wine-shop here, close after you, and sat near you. I had no difficulty in deducing from your unreserved conversation that the rumour openly going about among your admirers, the nature of your calling, and gradually what I had done at random seemed to shape itself into a purpose, Mr. Barsad. What purpose? the spy asked. It would be troublesome and might be dangerous to explain in the street. 
Could you favour me in confidence with some minutes of your company at the office of Telson's Bank, for instance, under a threat? Oh, did I say that? Then why should I go there? Really, Mr. Bassard, I can't say if you can't. Do you mean that you won't say, sir? the spy irresolutely asked. You apprehend me very clearly, Mr. Bassard. I won't. Carton's negligent recklessness of manner came powerfully in aid of his quickness and skill in such a business as he had in his secret mind, and with such a man as he had to do with. His practised eye saw it and made the most of it. Now I told you so, said the spy, said the spy, casting a reproachful look at his sister. If any trouble comes of this, it's your doing. Come, come, Mr. Bassard, exclaimed Sidney. Don't be ungrateful. But for my great respect for your sister, I might not have led up so pleasantly to a little proposal that I wish to make for our mutual satisfaction. Do you go with me to the bank? I'll hear what you've got to say. Yes, I'll go with you. I propose that we first conduct your sister safely to the corner of her own street. Let me take your arm, Miss Pross. This is not a good city at this time for you to be out in unprotected. And as your escort knows, Mr. Bassard, I will invite him to Mr. Lorry's with us. Are we ready? Come, then. Miss Pross recalled soon afterwards, and to the end of her life remembered, that as she pressed her hands on Sidney's arm and looked up in his face, imploring him to do no hurt to Solomon, there was a braced purpose in the arm and a kind of inspiration in the eyes which not only contradicted his light manner, but changed and raised the man. She was too much occupied then with fears for the brother who so little deserved her affection, and with Sidney's friendly reassurances adequately to heed what she observed. They left her at the corner of the street, and Carton led the way to Mr. Lorry's, which was within a few minutes' walk. John Barsad, or Solomon Pross, walked at his side. Mr. Lorry had just finished his dinner and was sitting before a cheery little log or two of fire, perhaps looking into their blaze for a picture of that younger, elderly gentleman from Telson's, who had looked into the red coals at the Royal George at Dover now a good many years ago. He turned his head as they entered, and showed the surprise with which he saw a stranger. "'Miss Pross's brother, sir,' said Sidney, "'Mr. Barsad.' "'Barsad,' repeated the old gentleman. "'Barsad.' I have an association with the name, and with the face. I told you you had a remarkable face, Mr. Bassard, observed Carton coolly. Pray, sit down. As he took a chair himself, he supplied the link that Mr. Lorry wanted, by saying to him with a frown, witness at that trial. Mr. Lorry immediately remembered, and regarded his new visitor with an undisguised look of abhorrence. Mr. Barsard has been recognised by Miss Pross as the affectionate brother you have heard of, said Sidney, and has acknowledged the relationship. I pass worse news. Darnay has been arrested again. Struck with consternation, the old gentleman exclaimed, What do you tell me? I left him safe and free within these two hours, and am about to return to him. Arrested for all that. When was it done, Mr. Barsard? Just now if at all. Mr. Barsard is the best authority possible, sir, said Sidney, and I have it from Mr. Barsard's communication to a friend and brother sheep over a bottle of wine that the arrest has taken place. He left the messengers at the gate and saw them admitted by the porter. There is no earthly doubt that he is retaken. Mr. Lorry's business eye read in the speaker's face that it was loss of time to dwell upon the point. Confused but sensible that something might depend on his presence of mind, he commanded himself, and was silently attentive. Now I trust, said Sidney to him, that the name and influence of Dr. Manette may stand him in as good stead tomorrow. You said he would be before the tribunal again tomorrow, Mr. Barsard? Yes, I believe so. In as good stead tomorrow as today, but it may not be so. I own to you. I am shaken, Mr. Lorry, by Dr. Manette's not having had the power to prevent this arrest. He may not have known of it beforehand, said Mr. Lorry. 
But that very circumstance would be alarming when we remember how identified he is with his son-in-law. That's true, Mr. Lorry acknowledged with his troubled hand at his chin and his troubled eyes on Carton. In short, said Sidney, this is a desperate time when desperate games are played for desperate stakes. Let the doctor play the winning game. I will play the losing one. No man's life here is worth purchase. Anyone carried home by the people today may be condemned tomorrow. Now, the stake I have resolved to play for, in case of the worst, is a friend in the conciergerie, and the friend I propose myself to win is Mr. Bassard. You need have good cards, sir, said the spy. I'll run them over. I'll see what I hold. Mr. Lorry, you know what a brute I am. I wish you'd give me a little brandy. It was put before him, and he drank off a glassful, drank off another glassful, pushed the bottle thoughtfully away. Mr. Barsard, he went on, in the tone of one who really was looking over a hand at cards. Sheep of the prisons, emissary of Republican committees, now turnkey, now prisoner, always spy and secret informer, so much the more valuable here for being English that an Englishman is less open to suspicion of subornation in those characters than a Frenchman. Represents himself to his employers under a false name. That is a very good card, Mr. Bassard, now in the employ of the Republican French government, was formerly in the employ of the aristocratic English government, the enemy of France and freedom. That's an excellent card. Inference clear as day in this region of suspicion that Mr. Bassard, still in the pay of the aristocratic English government, is the spy of Pitt, the treacherous foe of the Republic crouching in its bosom, the English traitor, an agent of all mischief much spoken of and so difficult to find. That's a card not to be beaten. Have you followed my hand, Mr. Bassard? Not to understand your play, returned the spy somewhat uneasily. I play my ace. Denunciation of Mr. Bassard to the nearest section committee. Look over your hand, Mr. Bassard, and see what you have. Don't hurry. He drew the bottle near, poured out another glassful of brandy, and drank it off. He saw that the spy was fearful of his drinking himself into a fit state for the immediate denunciation of him. Seeing it, he poured out and drank another glassful. Look over your hand carefully, Mr. Bassard. Take time. It was a poorer hand than he suspected. Mr. Bassard saw losing cards in it that Sidney Carton knew nothing of. Thrown out of his honourable employment in England, through too much unsuccessful hard swearing there, not because he was not wanted there, our English reasons for vaunting our superiority to secrecy and spies are of very modern date. He knew that he had crossed the Channel and accepted service in France, first as a tempter and an eavesdropper among his own countrymen there, gradually as a tempter and an eavesdropper among the natives. He knew that under the overthrown government he had been a spy upon Saint Antoine and Defarge's wine shop, had received from the watchful police such heads of information concerning Dr. Manette's imprisonment, release, and history as should serve him for an introduction to familiar conversation with the Defarges, and tried them on Madame Defarge, and had broken down with them signally. He always remembered with fear and trembling that the terrible woman had knitted when he talked with her, and had looked ominously at him as her fingers moved. He had since seen her in the section of Saint Antoine, over and over again, produce her knitted registers, and denounce people whose lives the guillotine then surely swallowed up. He knew, as everyone employed as he was did, that he was never safe. That flight was impossible, that he was tied fast under the shadow of the axe, and that the spite of his utmost turgiversation and treachery in furtherance of the reigning terror, a word might bring it down upon him. Once denounced, and on such grave grounds as had just now been suggested to his mind, he foresaw that the dreadful woman, of whose unrelenting character he had seen many proofs, would produce against him the fatal register, and would quash his last chance of life. Besides that all secret men are men soon terrified, here were surely cards enough of one black suit 
to justify the holder in growing rather livid as he turned them over. "'You scarcely seem to like your hand,' said Sidney, with the greatest composure. "'Do you play?' "'I think, sir,' said the spy, in the meanest manner, as he turned to Mr. Lorry, "'I may appeal to a gentleman of your years and benevolence, "'to put it to this other gentleman, so much your junior, "'whether he can under any circumstance reconcile it to his station "'to play the ace of which he has spoken. "'I admit that I am a spy, and that it is considered a discreditable station, "'though it must be filled by somebody, but this... "'Gentleman is no spy, and why should he so demean himself as to make himself one?' "'I play my ace, Mr. Bassard,' said Carton, taking the answer on himself and looking at his watch, "'without any scruple in a very few minutes.' "'I should have hoped gentlemen both,' said the spy, always striving to hook Mr. Lorry into the discussion, "'that your respect for my sister—' I could not better testify my respect for your sister than by finally relieving her of her brother, said Sidney Carton. You think not, sir? I have thoroughly made up my mind about it. The smooth manner of the spy, curiously in dissonance with his ostentatiously rough dress, and probably with his usual demeanour, received such a check from the inscrutability of Carton, who was a mystery to wiser and honester men than he, that it faltered here and failed him. While he was at a loss, Carton said, resuming his former air of contemplating cards, As indeed, now I think again, I have a strong impression that I have another good card here not yet enumerated. That friend and fellow sheep, who spoke of himself as pasturing in the country prisons, who was he? French. You don't know him, said the spy quickly. French, eh? repeated Carton, musing and not appearing to notice him at all, though he echoed his word. Well, he may be. Is, I assure you, said the spy, though it's not important. Though it's not important, repeated Carton in the same mechanical way. Though it's not important. No, it's not important, no. Yet I know the face. I think not. I am sure not. It can't be, said the spy. It can't be, muttered Sidney Carton retrospectively and idling his glass, which fortunately was a small one, again. Can't be. Spoke good French, yet like a foreigner, I thought. Provincial, said the spy. No, foreign, cried Carton, striking his open hand on the table, as a light broke clearly on his mind. Cly! Disguised, but the same man. We had that man before us at the old bailey. Now there you are hasty, sir, said Bassard, with a smile that gave his aquiline nose an extra inclination to one side. There you really give me an advantage over you. Cly, who I will unreservedly admit, at this distance of time, was a partner of mine, has been dead several years. I attended him in his last illness. He was buried in London at the church of St. Pancras in the Fields. His unpopularity with the blackguard multitude at the moment prevented my following his remains, but I helped to lay him in his coffin. Here Mr. Lorry became aware, from where he sat, of a most remarkable goblin shadow on the wall. Tracing it to his source, he discovered it to be caused by a sudden extraordinary rising and stiffening of all the risen and stiff hair on Mr. Cruncher's head. Let us be reasonable, said the spy, and let us be fair, to show you how mistaken you are, and what an unfounded assumption yours is, I will lay before you a certificate of Cly's burial, which I happen to have carried in my pocket-book. With a hurried hand he produced and opened it, ever since. There it is. Oh, look at it, look at it. You may take it in your hand, it's no forgery. Here Mr. Lorry perceived the reflection on the wall to elongate, and Mr. Cruncher rose and stepped forward. His hair could not have been more violently on end, if it had been that moment dressed by the cow with the crumpled horn in the house that Jack built. Unseen by the spy, Mr. Cruncher stood at his side and touched him on the shoulder like a ghostly bailiff. "'That there, Roger Cly, master,' said Mr. Cruncher, with a taciturn and iron-bound visage. "'So you put him in his coffin?' "'I did. Who took him out of it?' Bassard leaned back in his chair and stammered, "'What, what? What do you mean? 
I mean, said Mr. Cruncher, that he weren't never in it. No, not he. I'll have my head took off if he was ever in it. The spy looked round at the two gentlemen. They both looked in unspeakable astonishment at Jerry. I tell you, said Jerry, that you buried paving stones and earth in that there coffin. Don't go and tell me that you buried Cly. It was a taking. Me and two more knows it. How do you know? What's that to you? Egod, growled Mr. Cruncher. It's you I've got an old grudge against it is, with your shameful impositions upon tradesmen. I'd catch hold of your throat and choke you for half a guinea. Sidney Carton, who, with Mr. Lorry, had been lost in amazement at this turn in the business, here requested Mr. Cruncher to moderate and explain himself. At another time, sir, he returned evasively, the present time is ill convenient for explaining. What I stand to is that he knows well what that there cly was never in that there coffin. Let him say he was in so much as a word of one syllable, and I'll either catch hold of his throat and choke him for half a guinea. Mr. Cruncher dwelt upon this as quite a liberal offer, or I'll out and announce him. <laughs> I see one thing, said Carton. I hold another card, Mr. Bassard. Impossible. Here in raging Paris, with suspicion filling the air, for you to outlive denunciation, when you are in communication with another aristocratic spy of the same antecedents as yourself, who, moreover, has the mystery about him of having feigned death and come to life again. A plot in the prisons of the foreigner against the Republic. A strong card. A certain guillotine card. Do you play? No, returned the spy. I throw up. I confess that we were so unpopular with the outrageous mob that I only got away from England at the risk of being ducked to death, and that Cly was so ferreted up and down that he never would have got away with it all, that he never would have got away at all but for that sham. Though how this man knows it was a sham is a wonder of wonders to me. Never you trouble your head about this man, retorted the contentious Mr. Cruncher. You'll have trouble enough with giving your attention to that gentleman. And look here once more. Mr. Cruncher could not be restrained from making rather an ostentatious parade of his liberality. I'd catch hold of your throat and choke you for half a guinea. The sheep of the prisons turned from him to Sidney Carton and said, with more decision, It has come to a point. I go on duty soon and can't overstay my time. You told me you had a proposal. What is it? Now it is of no use asking too much of me. Ask me to do anything in my office, putting my head in great extra danger, and I had better trust my life to the chances of a refusal than the chances of consent. In short, I should make that choice. You talk of desperation. We are all desperate here. Remember, I may denounce you if I think proper, and I can swear my way through some stone walls and so can others. Now, what do you want with me? Not very much. You are a turnkey at the conciergery. I tell you once for all, there is no such thing as an escape possible, said the spy firmly. Why need you tell me what I have not asked? You are a turnkey at the conciergery? I am sometimes. You can be when you choose. I can pass in and out when I choose. Sidney Carton filled another glass with brandy, poured it slowly out upon the hearth, and watched as it dropped. It being all spent, he said, rising, So far we have spoken before these two, because it was as well that the merits of the card should not rest solely between you and me. Come into the dark room here, and let us have one final word alone. Chapter 9 The Game Made While Sidney Carton and the sheep of the prisons were in the adjoining dark room, Speaking so low that not a sound was heard, Mr. Lorry looked at Jerry in considerable doubt and mistrust. That honest tradesman's manner of receiving the look did not inspire confidence. He changed the leg on which he rested as often as if he had fifty of those limbs and were trying them all. He examined his fingernails with a very questionable closeness of attention, and whenever Mr. Lorry's eye caught his, he was taken with that peculiar kind of short cough, requiring the hollow of a hand before it, which is seldom, if ever, known to be an infirmity attendant on perfect openness of character. Jerry, said Mr. Lorry, 
Come here. Mr. Cruncher came forward sideways with one of his shoulders in advance of him. What have you been besides a messenger? After some cogitation accompanied with an intent look at his patron, Mr. Cruncher conceived the luminous idea of replying, Agricultural character. My mind misgives me much, said Mr. Lorry, angrily shaking a forefinger at him, that you have used the respectable and great house of Telson's as a blind, and that you have had an unlawful occupation of an infamous description. If you have, don't expect me to befriend you when you get back to England. If you have, don't expect me to keep your secret. Telson's shall not be imposed upon. I hope, sir, pleaded the abashed Mr. Cruncher, that a gentleman like yourself, what I've had the honour of odd jobbing till I'm grey at it, would think twice about harming of me, even if it was so. I don't say it is, but even if it was. And which is to be took into account of that if it was, it wouldn't, even then, be all a one side. Two sides to it. There might be medical doctors at the present hour, are picking up their guineas where an honest tradesman don't pick up his fardens. Fardens? No. Nor yet is our fardens. Our fardens? No. Nor yet is quarter. A banking away like smoke at Telson's and a cocking their medical eyes at that tradesman on the sly, a going in and going out on their own carriages. Oh, equally like smoke, if not more so. Well, that would be imposing too on Telson's, for you cannot sass the goose and not the gander. And here's Mrs. Cruncher, or leastways was in the old England times, and would be tomorrow, if cause given, a flopping again the business to the degree as is ruinating, stark ruinating. Whereas them medical doctors' wives don't flop, catch em at it. Or if they flop, their floppings goes in favour of more patients, and how can you rightly have one without t'other? Then, what with undertakers, and what with parish clerks, and what with sextons, and what with private watchmen, all avaricious and all in it, a man wouldn't get much by it, even if it was so. And what little a man did get would never prosper with him, Mr. Lorry. He'd never have no good of it. He'd want all along to be out of the line, if he could see his way out, being once in, even if it was so. Oh, cried Mr. Lorry, rather relenting. Nevertheless, I am shocked at the sight of you. Now, what I would humbly offer to you, sir, pursued Mr. Cruncher, even if it was so, which I don't say it is. Don't prevaricate, said Mr. Lorry. No, I will not, sir, returned Mr. Cruncher, as if nothing were further from his thoughts or practice, which I don't say it is. What I would humbly offer to you, sir, would be this. Upon that there stool, at that there bar, sets that there boy o' mine, brought up and grown up to be a man. What will errand you, message you, general light job you, till your eels is where your head is, if such should be your wishes. If it was so, which I still don't say it is, for I will not prewaricate to you, sir, let that there boy keep his father's place and take care of his mother. Don't blow upon that boy's father. Do not do it, sir. And let that father go into the line of the regular digging and make amends for what he would have undug if it was so, by digging of em in with a will, and with convictions respecting the future keeping of em safe. That, Mr. Lorry, said Mr. Cruncher, wiping his forehead with his arm, as an announcement that he had arrived at the peroration of his discourse, is what I would respectfully offer to you, sir. A man don't see all this here a-going on dreadful round him, in the way of subjects without heads. Dear me, plentiful enough fur to bring the price down to Porteridge, and hardly that without having his serious thoughts of things. And these here would be mine, if it was so, in treating of you, fur, to bear in mind what I said just now, I up and said in good cause when I might have kept it back. That at least is true, said Mr. Lorry. Say no more now. It may be that I shall yet stand your friend, if you deserve it, and repent in action, not in words. I want no more words. Mr. Cruncher knuckled his forehead, as Sidney Carton and the spy returned from the dark room. Adieu, Mr. Barsard, said the former. Our arrangement thus made, you have nothing to fear from me. He sat down in a chair on the hearth, over against Mr. Lorry. When they were done, Mr. Lorry asked him what he had done. Not much. If it should go ill with the prisoner, I have ensured access to him once. Mr. Lorry's countenance fell. 
It is all I could do, said Carton. To propose too much would be to put this man's head under the axe, and, as he himself said, nothing worse could happen to him if he were denounced. It was obviously the weakness of the position. There is no help for it. But access to him, said Mr. Lorry, if it should go ill before the tribunal, will not save him. I never said it would. Mr. Lorry's eyes gradually sought the fire. His sympathy with his darling and the heavy disappointment of his second arrest gradually weakened them. He was an old man now, overborne with anxiety of late, and his tears fell. You are a good man and true friend, said Carton in an altered voice. Forgive me if I notice that you are affected. I could not see my father weep and sit by careless, and I could not respect your sorrow more if you were my father. You are free from that misfortune, however. Though he said the last words with a slip into his usual manner, there was a true feeling and respect both in his tone and in his touch that Mr. Lorry, who had never seen the better side of him, was wholly unprepared for. He gave him his hand, and Carton gently pressed it. To return to poor Darnay, said Carton, don't tell her of this interview, or this arrangement. It would not enable her to go to see him. She might think it was contrived, in case of the worst, to convey to him the means of anticipating the sentence. Mr. Lorry had not thought of that, and he looked quickly at Carton to see if it were in his mind. It seemed to be. He returned the look, and evidently understood it. 